Dr. Matos from Detroit, and he's going to talk about stenosis and occlusion. Thanks, Welcome, everybody. My name is Mark Matos, and I'm the I work at Michigan Vascular Center. I'm the program director, and we're going to try in 15 minutes get you all you need to know about dialysis, access, stenosis, and occlusion. It's about 50 slides, so buckle up, strap in. Here we go. So, uh, basically, whoops, I don't know how to run this. There we go. Thank you. All right. So anyway, I have no disclosures, but this is my clinical disclosures. We work at three hospitals and four outpatient surgery centers, of which two of them are dialysis access centers. We have some experience. And anytime you give a talk, if somebody has contributed, you got to let them know. Dr. Saeed did this in 2014, and we've been building off his basic lecture ever since. Those are the four books that I used. I would suggest you look at them when you go home. So what's the importance of why we have to maintain and do dialysis access treatment after you put it in? Well, one out of 10 Americans will have chronic kidney disease. There's going to be a million people in end-stage renal failure by 2020. And right now, there's over 500,000, half a million people on hemodialysis. So it is a big deal. $42 billion worth in 2009. It's probably up to 50 by now. They don't have the latest estimates. And you can see, based on the green, that hemodialysis is the most expensive medical uh, therapy that has to be treated of those of either transplantation, peritoneal dialysis, and all of them all together. So it requires lots of care. So the overview, well, as uh, Linda's talked about, DOKI guidelines traded grafts for fistulas, but the peritoneal dialysis catheters did not move. It stayed the same because fistulas fail. I like using that term, not fistula first, but fistulas fail, and you've got to fix them. This is some data about primary and secondary patency rates. They do not stay open, ladies and gentlemen. They do not stay open. We have to fix them once you put them in. They never leave us. They're always with us, right? The other thing that's important, diabetes and hypertension, pretty significant. And the greatest cause of hospitalization and expense is placement and maintenance of hemodialysis grafts, period. So we have to learn how to do this well. So what's the pathology and the pathophysiology? Well, you have to know the etiology, clinical presentation, and the hemodynamic dysfunction in order to be a good dialysis doc. If you don't know that, you're going to fail and you're not going to do well. High flow states, high shear stress, central venous instrumentation, and needle sticks. Those are the bugaboos of grafts and fistulas. They cause intimal hyperplasia, they cause graft damage, and they produce stenoses and occlusions. And we have to find out how to fix those correctly. This is what an intimal hyperplastic lesion looks at the distal venous anastomosis. Looks bad. So how do people present? Well, they can present without any symptoms. They usually present to our office with pulsatility and a pulsatile graft or fistula, dilated veins around the chest, progression, pseudoaneurysm, um, progression of new pseudoaneurysm, progression of arm edema, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what an arm might look like and what a chest might look like when you have a central venous obstruction. Uh, one patient on the bottom right, on the bottom on the top left is when they have a cephalic vein fistula with poor outflow and you get pushback of the, of the flow. The hemodynamic indicators are just shown for your information there. I don't have to go into any detail, but there are specific hemodialysis machine indicators that would suggest a failing graft. If you're going to be in treat excess, you have to know the anatomy and you have to know your conduit. You have to understand your failure modes, and that guides your treatment and your access sites and what to use and when to use it. These are the common procedures that Linda just discussed. I like to look when I treat people in terms of segmentation of AV access, and you should start thinking about this when you go on your rotations, because everybody has each of these six parts, inflow, anastomosis, main body, venous anastomosis, venous outflow, and central. And you're going to have to treat all six at some point, and you have to know how. The majority of the access stenoses in my practice are probably comes at the venous end of things, and you can see the percentages there. This is just out of a paper from one of a, a, a textbook I was using that showed basically when you had a forearm loop ABG where the disease tends to occur. This is at 129 patients. This is the failure site centrally, which tends to be at the subclavian nominant vein junction or subclavian alone. So how do we treat it, right? You've got the etiology, the pathophysiology, you've got your plan. Well, your access program has to have five parts to it, right? Create, maintain, revise, replace terminate and move on. 
The endovascular interventions are based on balloon all alone, balloon and stent, balloon and covered stent, balloon that's cutting, thrombectomy, thrombolysis, combination of any of those, and then a hybrid approach, which Linda discussed using the hero graft. Open surgical interventions that treat access and stenosis include venous anastomosis repairs, patch, anastomotic advancement, turndowns, arterial anastomosis, it's, it's proximalization or patch angioplasty, whether or not it's a stenosis or based on steel, and whether or not you want to put it in an interposition graft. Sorry, I'm going a little bit quickly, but they've given you 15 minutes for probably a month-long discussion, right? So what is primary PTA or primary stenting? Well, the data would suggest that stenting doesn't work in a primary fashion, unlike the arterial system. And it should only be used in a suboptimal, suboptimal response after balloon angioplasty. So resist the urge to primarily stent. But obviously, you do what your attendings tell you, right? And you, and you do what they say, or she says. So I like to think of it as the PTA angioplasty in venous disease in the access is never perfect. And the motto is, I live to fight another day. It's never always going to be perfect. You can come back in a couple months and redo it. It's not like an arterial lesion. PTA and bare metal stent, severe residual stenosis or occlusion that occurs early, uh, and or if you have a recurrence and a residual, uh, then I would consider a bare metal stent. We usually like to do three or four episodes of balloon only before we go to bare metal stent. We resist stents at all costs if we can. There's some data suggesting that cover stents in the venous outflow works. Uh, Ziv Askell from New York in 2010, um, uh, probably no, it's later on, showed that covered stents had a better primary and secondary patency without loss of collateralization and without uh, upper extremity edema. Here's an example. Uh, we side branch coiled to try and improve flow in a cephalic vein AVF. That didn't work, so we ballooned it, and it did just fine. Now, you can see on the bottom right that does not look perfect by any means, but we'll take it. Flow rates are so high, well, this will be acceptable. Now, this most likely will come back in three months, and so you have to be prepared to treat it again, and that's okay. Uh, and I think you should never worry about failure in dialysis grafts because you're going to come back. Here's an example of a low flow state in a left brachial axillary AVG. You can see that the entire venous end, the venous anastomosis, and the outflow vein appear to be disease, and so we had to dilate everything. You can see that, that on the bottom right that the area of the graft is not great, and you might be tempted to put a stent in there. We did not. We just did a prolonged inflation up to two minutes, um, and uh, it, it came back, and it did just nicely. It doesn't have to be perfect. The other thing I would add on balloon angioplasty of veins, it's not like arteries. You're not cracking plaque. You're stretching intima, and you're stretching scar, so the balloon goes up slow, and it stays up for two minutes at three minutes at a time. You don't need heparinization to do that. It, it's pretty resilient. Here's an example of a cephalic vein orange stenosis. And again, simple balloon angioplasty, and it works. You don't need to stent for the most part. Here's an example of a venous outflow stenosis beyond the anastomosis. And again, you can see on the bottom panel, it's not perfect. But for a dialysis graph with a 600 to 1,000 milliliter per minute volume flow, it works just fine. And then when we get centrally, we tend to use bigger balloons, 12 by 4s, 14 by 4s, uh, because the disease occurs in the subclavian and the nominate vein. Again, you're not looking for perfection, but you're looking for improvement. Here's an example of a, a nominate vein occlusion based on the red arrows. And, uh, and sometimes in occlusions, you have to balloon multiple times for periods of great length. You can see on the bottom right, there was significant wasting, so we had to persist over a long period of time until finally we got an acceptable result. And you can see the difference. There's no more collaterals uh, on that slide, which means that the flow is now primarily in the main conduit and not through the collaterals. Here's an example of PTA and stenting in anastomosis where we had, did have to stent that after a balloon angioplasty, we had a very, very poor result. We know this would thrombose off, so we had to re put a bare metal stent in. How about somebody in, in the venous, uh, in the groin? Well, here's an occlusion of the external iliac vein. We cannulated and got a balloon up, but it really, really wasn't a good result. We knew that there was going to thrombose off, and that patient might have one dialysis, two dialysis runs, then he's coming back to me with a thrombose loop AVG, which are just misery to declot. They're just not any fun. 
So we ended up putting a stent in and got a pretty good result. Covered stents, those are the four that I know. We don't use the wall stent very, the cover, I mean the wall graft very much is too stiff, but the other three we use quite a bit when it is indicated. So this is a study from Ziv Haskell, uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2010. So their primary patency was much better than balloon alone at venous anastomosis, had decreased risk for reintervention and freedom from future, uh, future events, and the restenosis rate was much lower. Uh, here's an example where at the break axe, there looks like there might be a little bit of extravasation, uh, and we went ahead and uh, placed a stent in there, a uh, covered stent, and you can see that it's without problem. Hero graph I don't need to go into, but it's designed really for patent fistulas, and you're saving the access for catheter-dependent patients or patients approaching dependency. Uh, this is, Linda's already shown this, so I won't belabor it. This is just an example of surface on a patient. And then how about grafts that are occluded? How do we treat those? Well, it depends on who you are and who your staff is, right? You're either a cleaner, a macerator, a compressor, a sweeper, a dissolver, a pulser, or a scrubber. They all happen, everybody does them. It depends, you just gotta ask your surgeon. I am a scrubber. We just get balloons and we, we balloon dilate the whole thing and then back and forth scrubbing technique, it opens it up just fine. Uh, we don't need an angiojet, which is $1,000, which takes away your profit in an OBL. And you guys should all be learning that as you get ready to graduate in two years, because you're gonna be forced with finding out how do I make a living uh, out in the real world. Um, procedural techniques for thrombose grafts include angioplasty, lysis, real lysis, mechanical thrombectomy, stenting, stent grafting, and any combination of those, right? Each of those would be a 30-minute talk, so I apologize for going so quick. Here's an example at our place where we did a thrombectomy of a clotted graft but had residual thrombus and may even had a little extravasation, so we had to place a covered stent in there. Whoops, I don't know if I can go back. I can't think I can go back, so. But anyway, so lots of different ways to treat stenoses and occlusions. You have to figure out, based on your faculty, how they do it, and everybody will do it differently for the most part. But in summary, how do we look for them? We look for people with clinical presentation, how, when to treat them, when they're symptomatic, or if they have hemodynamic dysfunction when the dialysis center calls you, how to treat them endovascular primarily, bare metal stenting selectively, Covered stenting, very specific in open surgery, is all secondary. We never go to primary open surgery anymore. It's all done from an endovascular approach until we can't use that anymore, then we go to open. I think it benefits and increases the quality of life. It decreases the need for central venous catheters if you can get this done. It increases the survival time for the AVF. These are some of the reading references that I would suggest you go home over the next two years and read because uh, I think you'll get a good idea about dialysis. And there's some new websites at kidneyacademy.com and dialysis controversies that'll be valuable. Thank you very much, guys.